Hey everybody, this is Brad Dykes and hi. <clears throat> uh, we're going into phase two of option three. Before I disassemble all of this, uh, and I was, I was reminded that uh, everybody likes to see every single detail possible, so I'll try to do that more going forward. But the next step that which we're going to be doing is we're going to be using what is known as thermal registration. And that's where I'm using a uh, laser-based thermal tracking system to gauge averages on temperatures in the format that which I have here. Understanding that uh, this is going to be formatted based on open airflow like you see here and then also eventually it will go up into its home up there uh, where it will set and do a series of, of tests before I disassemble this and put it back together to uh, start getting into the Proxmox modeling for DevOps. So with this being the case uh, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be what's doing an aspect hit on each of these processors. I'm also going to hit the aspect hit in there on the graphics chipsets because I'm reaching out to the GPU to add it to the equation of the CPU. Now we all know that uh, cluster environments work fairly well with GPUs but they work very well with CPUs. There's a video out there on YouTube that talks why CPUs have a level of performance that GPUs can't match but GPUs obviously add value to the equation because they're so dynamically rewritable. So that's the benefit of both worlds if you're using both together. So with that being the case, I'm going to be doing a temp scan of this unit running on average uh, ambient temperature. And um, this will be done by each unit on airflow. And it will be a power supply. The unit will run and then I'll do the averages on it for boot and post. And that's going to be good for now in regards to uh, doing that process. Then we'll have to relocate it up here. And above these eSATA and uh, USB 3 based chassis here. And it'll be up on this section. And again, I'll run the power test. And we'll see how it works and see how it flows out. This will result in probably a 3 to 4 degree variance because of the confinement. Which out here, as you can see very clearly, there's no restriction on that right now. So as you can see right here, this unit has its power output into it. It's going in and we'll be initiating its startup process and it is coming up now. And there's no interface with this whatsoever. So it is a baseline configuration and I'll be hitting it with a sample test of uh, three strikes with the thermal imager, or the thermal thermometer system right here and uh, that will give me the readout that I'm looking for both exterior to the nature of the fan which is showing 66 and that's to be expected because it's just powering up right now and then of course on the interior I'm getting the beginnings of an increase in heat on the actual processor which is good and on the GC, G, C, GPU it's getting warmer and so this is going to be three strikes one at the beginning one in the middle and one after sustained operational temp. So we're going to let that go. Just out of curiosity, there is no heat increase on the SATA and there is no heat increase on the M.2. So um, this blade represents the exterior side. This blade represents the interior side. And this blade, or any of these three in the middle, represent containment side. So these are going to give me averages, and that will be my baseline. Then I'll put it up into the rack enclosure to get us to the next point. Okay, so we've got the exterior three set ratings identified. I only ran five, six minutes. That's all I needed. And then over here we have the other side. And the heat factors do come from the underside chassis, which is different where this was contained and restricted. This is not, and believe it or not, this little piece of a metal here does matter. Uh, you're also gonna get the air inclusion effect here, which means I suspect blade five is going to be the highest um, internal, but with the lowest on the GPU and, and this M2 and so on because of the exterior back end being so out in the open. Now the temperature in here right now currently is 67 degrees and so that's the baseline degrees and um, so it floats between 66 and 67 
The averages on this first blade was 72 high and 70 low on average, which means there was a little fluctuation, but not much. That's good. Remember, we're just doing baseline temperature only. And then now I'm gonna go ahead and do the exact same steps with this unit and start the process of identifying its heat sink. It's pretty cool actually. It's interior, which is up by a couple of degrees. The GPU, 71. The M.2 is 72. The back plate, is holding at 66 so the, C the cpu on this side is running the coolest and i'll go ahead and write those numbers down here in a minute after i re redo the test again um i know what the baseline post is so with that being the case <clears throat> i'm going to be able to uh average this out in roughly about five to ten minutes and remember this is this is going to be nominal level temperature check we're not doing a workload we expect workloads will have their own overheads in that process. Okay, we now have got the averages on this. Now we're moving into the interior. This one will be the most interesting. These three will be the most interesting uh, because I already know there's a three degree increase when these are all running at the same time. So these won't experience it on the outside, but these three will experience three, uh, about a three degree increase because of the fact that they're mixed in between blades. But this one is coming up now and I'm going to get the averages on that one. Now, if I was going to do a test more accurately, I would bring these guys up extremely carefully, though, uh, in, but in such a way so that I could confirm again for the second time that my, my degree aspect is still 3 degrees. But even then, uh, that's based on the workload, and I don't really have a major environment where I can generate the workload yet, so I think I'm just going to revisit that at a later date. Okay, so we've got our set checks here. Let me go ahead and take that one offline. Okay, so now we're bringing up the middle blade. And we'll get that going. And allow it to post. Okay. It is doing its job. And again, I'm going to repeat the same set, three samples on startup, finish post, and averages on time. All right. Kind of hard to hit that spot. Oh, you jumped up in temperature. Okay, that's to be expected. Your airflow is a little bit more restricted. The M.2 is running nice and cool. And we'll check the back plate. So it's doing rather well. I'm impressed. I didn't think the lows would go this would stay this low. So what I'm referring to is uh, my concern about the convection effect is working more than I thought. Um, I'm not getting any centralized heat flowing. I can feel the air rising, which is a good sign. Um, obviously, you can see that the CPU fan is spinning and doing its thing. and uh, But surprisingly, the temperatures are not deviating any more than maybe 2 degrees. That's impressive. Okay, we've got all the blades but this one done. And it is in the process of posting now. And we're going to re re repeat this process again. Um, as you can see over there, the LED is coming up. I'm just curious to see why I'm getting a an alert on that. I don't know. I have to find that out. That might. I think I know why. That's actually not the same release rev as the others. So it's a different kind of M.2 that has a status LED on it. And that's why it's coming up like it is. See, it's right there. All right. So we we'll begin the process of getting our static numbers. Okay, so I've got 
the last set here. Sorry for the boredom, but I've been told don't do that. Make sure everybody gets as much recording as possible. And we're running through the samples now. Surprisingly, these three internals are staying just as cool as the outers, which is better than I expected. So that being the case, the next thing we have to talk to you is the fact that um, I could pursue other ways to cool things down, right? I could choose to change the aluminum heatsink that is on the uh, CPU, get a broader, more capable one, but yet still reduced fo footprint that blows out. The only problem with those is they, they're not directional. They blow through the heatsink to the left and to the right or to the front and to the back. And so they defeat convection. I and mean, you do want to be successful in your convection. That's where the air flows in one direction to allow the heat transfer effect to work. When you create small eddy currents over and over and over all around, it stifles that exchange. So probably not a good idea. The other suggestion that came up, and I have researched this quite heavily many times, is the nature of TEDs. TEDs are very much like light emitting diodes, except instead of dealing with light... Okay, so what do I mean by TEDs? Well, first, let's start off with, lo and behold, heat sinks. We have passive heat sinks, which is basically just the, the metal. And in this case, this is a very, very basic heat sink. It's cast metal, not even aluminum, and it has a little fan on it. And this is a Pentium 2 processor. And then over time, they began to develop these technologies as you see is this Pentium Pro here and this metal housing here and then even over time there they began to start integrating sort of like a TED technology that a heat pump basically that helps pull sucks that heat right off of that heat sink and pushes it up and out into the larger heat sink so it's it's heat sink on top of heat sink kind of strategy now what is a TED really well, let me show you all right, so first thing to do is understand what a diode is, okay? A light emitting diode uses the electron flow of energy in different ways, and in this case, light, and it generates the light output with a very little heat. It's a, a very efficient way of dealing with electricity in one direction. We use diodes to kind of stipend or um, keep the flow of electrons in positive negative natures in the right places. Now, how powerful is this? Well, let me show you how really powerful and capable this really is. Now, these are just basic LEDs from an old flashlight, but I keep them around. Now, over here, you see that? That's an LED, and it's glowing. See? Now, that giant heat sink you see there, it's acting like a heat pump in itself. This is a great example of what a TED looks like. The only difference is the TED does not emit light unlike this particular version of diode does. It, part of it converts it into light. And as you can see, it is incredibly bright. I can't look at it directly. It would hurt my eyes. But it's just an example of, you know, what and what can you do with a TED style thing. Now, the key detail here is when you look at technologies like this and you see the chipsets, right? There's a lot going on here more than you know. So when I see when I say it, there's a lot more going on here than you know, let me explain. You see, this heat sink here is a heat pipe. It has a chemical compound inside these little tubes, and it stays in a liquid state. Gets down to the bottom port right there, as you see, gets heated, and then is passed up the other way into the radiator and cooled down. Now, that seems a little bit antiquated versus using something like a strictly just a basic passive heat sink. Well, the truth of the matter is we kind of push our electronics, right? All electronics in their most baseline state would work just fine, but the performance capacity of the chip wouldn't be up to our expectation. So that's why you can see sometimes right here integrated circuits that have no requirement 
because they generate no heat because their requirement is very low. They don't have to do a lot. Um, but if they time clock it, what we call overclocking, the chip begins to heat up. And because it heats up, uh, it would be prudent to put a heatsink on this kind of a chipset to allow us to do this. Now, in this case, this is just a memory buffer chip. That's not really a great example. But GPUs are an excellent example because you can buy video cards that don't have heat sinks on them. They're just thin PCIe cards and they'll have the most minimal baseline um, heat sink on them. You know, something a little bit bigger than this and that's it. And that's all it needs. And it does a decent job. But then you have other chipsets out there that um, are going to get cycled. And they're going to get spun up and you can overclock them, which is a feature you can do with motherboards. And in doing so, all of a sudden, standard heat sinks don't seem to work very well. And the worst enemy to an integrated chip is heat, right? So you don't want your chips getting too hot or they just begin to disintegrate internally. Uh, they break their points. They're very fine little wire contacts. They're not even wire contacts. They're actually a uh, CPU die. And there are tiny little wires that, you know, or there's soldering points like you see back here. And these soldering points, all of this stuff is susceptible to heat. So you don't want it to get too hot. So this is why we step up from basic heat sinks like this to the overclocking heat sinks you have here. But again, the question is, well, guys, why can't we use TEDs and just get rid of these giant heat sinks? The truth is you can't. A TED goes between the heat sink right here and the actual processor. Now that's complicated because as you can see, it's pretty tight in there, right? And some processors have TEDs built into them, but they're very tiny. And all they do is improve moving the heat out into the heat sink. This guy is a heat pipe. He's actually better. Um, these wires, you see these tubes here, they basically allow another kind of convection effect where it is from a fluid to a gas state. And as it gets warmer and it converts to a gas, it moves up into the heat sink area, cools down, it comes back down as liquid again. And this convection effect that runs inside this is what we call a mononomical style static entity. In other words, it's like metal. It re it's really great. It's physics. It's basic. We don't have to rely on an electrical process to allow us to do this. So as you can see my TED right there, and this is a very old one, and I took the lid off it and I integrated with LED sets. This is now more of like a flashlight than it is just a heat pump. That guy right there gets so hot that this heat sink here can barely keep it um, cool. But if I don't have it there, that TED will catch on fire. And that's an electrical process that exists that we don't, we're not really, really, really fond about because when we do that, that means internal failures can happen. If we use Mother Nature, like metals and the physics of converting from wa uh, water to, I'm sorry, a liquid to a solid, uh, to a gas state, and that heat dissipation effect that happens with physics in regards to it, then at that point stage, we can keep things really cool fairly efficiently with no overhead as in no need for another electrical device to be added in the equation of many many electrical devices who are trying to complete a task so you've kept it su simple stupid or simple sweet so with that being the case i now know what this is going to look like temperature wise i'm going to remount this in the next video into the rack with its with its setups and everything like that again i'm not going to be doing any heavy powering up of anything like that. I've already bounced these without uh, properly shutting them down. But that's okay. I don't mind rebuilding the Proxmox cluster. It's just a process. But anyways, with this being said, the next video you see, you'll see its mounting process into the rack enclosure so that you know how well that's going to work out. So with that being said, this is Brad Dyke signing off. You guys have a great time. Keep learning. Keep having fun. And if it gets a little stressed out, take a break. Get a a glass of wine or uh you know mug of beer or something or whatever makes you happy and do that for a little while then come back to this and just keep learning and keep having fun this is brad dyke signing off god bless